Hi guys, so uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, I made a video on, on spadroons. Um, a spadroon, for those of you who didn't see that video yet, or who are just wondering what the hell is a spadroon, is one of these. It's um, a cut and thrust blade mounted on what looks like a small sword hilt, uh, usually a double shell hilt like this. This is a British 1796 pattern infantry officer's spadroon. In fact, this is probably a sergeant's one rather than an officer's one. Um, and although it's a cut and thrust blade, it's uh, dead straight and it's really more of a thrust centric blade. And my assertion in the last video was that spadroons are, uh, in my tastes and opinions, a bit crap. Uh, why? Um, in short, um, because they're not great at thrusting and they're not great, in fact they're pretty awful at cutting. Um, why? Well, generally speaking, they're a bit too, too light in the blade. They lack any kind of meat at this end of the blade for cutting. Um, but equally the point of balance is usually quite close to the hand as well. This is not too bad, this one actually. Um, but because they're set up to be optimised for the thrust, they're very poor at cutting in general, got very, very little uh, authority in the cut. And in addition to that, they are quite uh, flexible blades, and flexible blades tend to be unforgiving blades in the cut, and that's something I will talk about probably in a future video, hopefully. Um, and the uh, same reason that they're not really great for thrusting is that they are very flexible. Um, and very flexible blades are not great for thrusting either. Um, this is actually something that's mentioned in um, many accounts actually, but um, most famously in accounts from the Crimean War, uh, the Battle of Balaclava, 1854, uh, the charge of the Light Brigade, and uh, several um, cavalry troopers and officers from that battle report uh, trying to thrust into, uh, this is on horseback of course, um, trying to thrust into Russian uh, soldiers' greatcoats, a woolen greatcoat, like a winter overcoat, um, and not being able to penetrate the point because their blades were uh, flexing. Uh, so they, the blades weren't pointed enough and, and the blades were too flexible. Um, so um, the spadroon is uh, not really balanced right, doesn't really, not really shaped right for cutting very well, and uh, is, is really a bit too flexible for thrusting well. Um, it's not an absolutely dreadful sword, um, but uh, there are worse swords around, but it's, it's not very good. And uh, this was used by infantry officers during the Napoleonic period. However, um, it was fairly common during the Napoleonic period, especially towards the, the latter stages from about, well, from maybe from 1795 onwards actually, um, for, um, for infantry officers who saw a lot of action, uh, or who were members of what were called flank uh, com companies, in other words like uh, skirmishing or rifles, uh, these kind of um, more sort of uh, almost like special forces of the time, to carry sabres instead of uh, spadroons. And initially they started off, it seemed, carrying uh, either cavalry sabres or, um, or uh, swords that were based on cavalry sabres, so they were perhaps a bit shorter and a bit lighter, better suited for fighting on foot. Um, but the spadroon remained the regulation infantry officer's sword in the British Army until um, 1822 when it was officially replaced by a sabre. Um, and uh, in 1803 uh, certain flank officer uh, companies like rifle, rifle officers for example uh, had the uh, sabre come in as their official sword. But this remained the main uh, infantry officer's sword of the Napoleonic period and uh, right the way through to 1822. Um, but it wasn't a great, or well, I don't believe it was a great uh, infantry sword uh, for the reasons I've stated. Now what I want to say um, to, to sort of round that point off and something after making my last video, uh, some people who clearly love spadroons, and we should mention that some fencing masters did like spadroons. Um, Donald McBain, for example, seems to have liked spadroons. Uh, and spadroons are featured in Napoleonic period fencing treatises by people who dealt with both the sabre and the, uh, and the spadroon. Um, and um, what I really want to say is that a spadroon doesn't have to be crap. It's not inherently crap by nature. Um, it's just that the particular model that I am most familiar with, the British um, 1796 shown here, I think is quite crap. 
Um, but spadroons can be made better. How can they be made better? Essentially by making them stiffer. Um, and uh, it should be said as well that there's quite a bit of variation in the 1796 officer spadroons, and some of them have more serious blades on them. The average one is uh, doesn't have a very serious blade, as uh, by my definition, but some of them do. Some of them have uh, more dedicated thrusting blades, and some of them, in fact, have um, broadsword blades on. So the ones carried sometimes by Scottish or Highland um, regiment officers seem to have sometimes had broadsword blades put on them. Um, but um, it is possible to make a sword that is thrust-centric, but good at thrusting and has some ability to cut. And I have an example here. Um, so this is actually a sword from the Crimean War period. This is actually 1855, so end of, end of the Crimean War. Uh, but this is a, a Coldstream Guards officer's sword made by Wilkinson. Um, latterly known as the Wilkinson Sword Company, but at the time just known as Henry Wilkinson of Pall Mall, London. Um, and it's, it's numbered, so we know when it was made in 1855, and uh, we, we know that it was owned by an officer of the Coldstream Guards, who were, of course, out in the Crimean War. And um, this is a very interesting blade because it's a non-regulation blade um, for the period. The regulation blade was a sabre blade, as I've shown in other videos, um, but this is double-edged, um, and it's actually a really quite uh, relatively stiff blade um, and it's got edges front and back, double edged as I mentioned um, and it's um, not got a great cutting capacity but it would certainly be able to give uh, you know, a moderate cut to the, to the sort of fingers, neck or face or so on but most importantly it's a very good thrusting sword it is, I won't push it into my hand because it's relatively sharp but it is as mentioned pretty stiff Okay, and that's really why I respect this blade more than the regulation, uh, the earlier Napoleonic Spadroon blade, um, because essentially it's stiffer, um, and I think that's very important. And I would also say that the, the shape of the uh, tip of the weapon, given that it's a thrusting weapon, you want it to have quite a narrow profile at the end and have as little resistance as possible at penetrating clothes, which can provide reasonable protection against, against bladed weapons. Um, so, in short, spadroons can be good weapons. And uh, another example I would give of a good spadroon is the, um, is the French 1882 uh, blade um, that was brought in in 1882 and replaced uh, earlier types of sabre blade. And that is actually quite similar to this. The only difference really is it has um, two fillers up the blade. But it's a very stiff blade and it has a very uh, narrow, pointy profile. Um, and essentially, these are very thrust-centric swords. They're really kind of like short rapiers, but they have some, some ability to give a cut um, when needed. Um, especially, of course, with a push cut or a draw cut, you can cut with basically any blade. But these have the ability to chop as well if needed. Um, so, there we go. My view of spadroons is that the best thing to do with a spadroon, if you have to use a spadroon, is to make it as effective at thrusting as possible because a spadroon, as a spadroon, is never really going to be a very good cutting sword. You're better using a sabre or a backsword or a broadsword if you want more cutting capacity. Thank you.